outset, I'd like to thank and congratulate Dr. Mayur Agarwal and the entire team at home in India for having me here and also for doing spectacular work across the country as a team called Home on India. Friends, in the next couple of minutes, I shall take you through this topic of sarcopenic obesity, what a clinician needs to know. And I'm going to address this topic by answering three questions. I will talk about the what, the why, and the how. I'll talk about what is sarcopenia and sarcopenic obesity, what is the concept, how do we define it, what's the problem statement, especially with respect to the Indian setting. I'll talk about why this is important for all of us as clinicians here to know about it. How is it relevant to our clinical practice? How do we understand its pathogenesis leading on to its complications? And the last and the most important bit, how do we manage it? What are the three pillars of management of sarcopenia and sarcopenic obesity in terms of diet, exercise and medicines? So let's get started directly with the first thing and I think all of us are well aware uh, of what is coming in the future, what we call it as the grey dawn or the grey wave and what I mean by this terminology is that yes, with an increasing life expectancy across the globe and even in countries like India, we are definitely going to have more and more elderly people in the society. When you look at the life expectancy in some of the states in India, it is at par with many Western countries. And so in this regard, we as healthcare professionals need to gear up, need to know how to address the problems of the elderly and sarcopenia and sarcopenic obesity is definitely one of them. When you talk of the normal process of aging, what we know is that as we age, the fat content in the body tends to increase, whereas the muscle content tends to decrease. And if I plot this in a very simple two by two table, we see that anybody with a low muscle mass or having a low muscle mass in uh, combination with a high fat mass would be called to have sarcopenic obesity. The problem definitely gets more compounded in the Indian population where we know that we are already prone to have much higher body fat than other populations despite having a lower BMI. This was a study that we did a couple of years ago looking at the prevalence of lean diabetes. People who are thin, not having type 1 diabetes, but type 2 diabetes or, or a diabetes of a low BMI and how this is common in the Indian setting. Another study that we did, we talked about the prevalence of normal weight obesity. People who have a normal BMI and high body fat. To our surprise, we found that about two thirds of the people who have a normal BMI in this particular cohort actually had high body fat percentage. And the prevalence of diabetes, hypertension and dyslipidemia in these people was significantly higher than who are non-obese. So when you're talking of a phenotype wherein the BMI is low, but the fat content is high, obviously if I have to increase the fat content, I need to reduce the other compartments of the body if I want to keep the BMI still low. And that is what contributes to sarcopenic obesity. Looking at the definition of what is sarcopenia first, sarcopenia consists of three broad aspects that we talk about. We talk about physical function, which can be easily measured with the help of gait speed. We talk about muscle strength that can be measured with the help of a hand grip uh, uh, dynamometer or we talk of muscle mass, which can be measured with the help of some kind of a body composition analyzer. And if there is presence of at least two out of three, and there are several different uh, consensus as well as uh, definitions for how to define sarcopenia, but ultimately all, all of them look at these three parameters, and at least two of them should be present to define sarcopenia. More recently, the European consensus group came up with this proposition that if there is only presence of low muscle strength, it should be probable sarcopenia. If there is low muscle strength with low muscle mass as assessed by a body composition analyzer, it would qualify for the definition of sarcopenia. But if there is all three of them, if I add low physical performance to sarcopenia, it would be severe sarcopenia. And there are several Asian definitions, the studies from India as well. But very recently, there's a group of uh, uh, 
uh, people from different South Asian countries came up with something more simple, given the hard reality today that we do not have DEXA scans available at the every nook and corner or every PHC, or nor do we have body composition analyzers so widespread in our country. We need to talk about more simple definitions, more practical definitions that we can use in our day to day practice and still keeping the three pillars of muscle strength, muscle function and muscle mass, probably looking at more clinical and easy to measure parameters. We can measure muscle mass through a high end MRI or DEXA scan, but we can get a fairly good idea of that with the help of calf circumference as well. Talking about muscle function, not very difficult to ask our patients to have a particular distance to cover and talk about the walking speed. Also looking at muscle strength is not very difficult but even if we want to make it more simple what we can use is a very simple screening questionnaire called the sar f questionnaire having to use only five questions each of which is graded between zero one and two and if our patient has a sar f questionnaire score of more than equal to four yes we can suspect sarcopenia and do the formal assessment for these patients so there is indeed a simple way of assessing sarcopenia first or at least screen patients for sarcopenia and then help in our clinical practice to diagnose them. So we talked about sarcopenia. What about sarcopenic obesity? Again, a lot of definitions that have been proposed. It is essentially presence of sarcopenia in the presence of high body fat percentage. Several uh, definitions have been proposed and based on which the prevalence globally varies from as low as 3% to 12%. We know that body fat percentage in the Asian phenotype is definitely much higher than the West. The cutoffs are, that have been proposed in the West is as simple as 25 to 35 percent, but our metabolic thresholds are much lower. So probably a much lower body fat percentage is proposed in the Indian setting. Talking about the problem statement, and again, very recently, we looked at this uh, longitudinal aging study in India, data from over 72,000 elderly people from India through the national survey. And we look at that approximately one in 10 people, elderly people in India have sarcopenic obesity. So it is definitely not something that can be just brushed under the carpet. It is something that needs to be recognized, is common, is something that is very specific also to our ethnicity and is going to be increasing in the coming years. So with this, I move on to the second part of my topic, as to why is it important in clinical practice to identify people with sarcopenic obesity along with sarcopenia. Let's talk about pathogenesis and what we realize is this indeed is a vicious cycle. Well, if somebody has got sarcopenia or poor muscle strength and mass, definitely that person cannot do adequate amount of exercise or physical activity that is required. And therefore, that patient is ultimately going to burn less calories and accumulate more fat and get into an obese phenotype. Well, if somebody has obesity, there is increased amount of fat, fat often in ectopic sites. And one of the sites ectopically is also the muscle. And if there is increased intramuscular fat, definitely it contributes to poor muscle function and strength. Not to forget that when there is obesity, there is also a much higher increment of inflammatory cytokines which also deeply and negatively impact the muscle and therefore again ensuing sarcopenia and the cycle keeps going on further on when we start aging this entire process is catalyzed by all the hormonal changes that happen with aging thereby further compounding the problem of sarcopenic obesity and then this particular slide you see that there are so many problems that can be affected by sarcopenic obesity but talking about hardcore evidence of what evidence do we have and maybe i'll start with just talking about mortality to begin with and we see in this excellent study of over 4500 people aged between 60 to 80 years we see that they're looking at mortality and they're talking about follow-up of as good as 11 years and when we look at the mortality the white bar that you see here are people who are normal weight but then when we see obesity, that is the dark black spots that you see. So we see that definitely people with obesity have a higher mortality than normal weight people. But if the person has only sarcopenia, that provides a higher mortality odds 
than just people with obesity. But if you combine sarcopenia and sarcopenic obesity, and these are the biggest bars that you see. And so, yes, sarcopenic obesity is a very strong indicator of mortality. We're talking about frailty, disability, and admissions. Again, in this project uh, where they've uh, studied men, and uh, we look at the odds ratio of frailty as high as two times higher risk of developing frailty if you have sarcopenic obesity. Not only this, we talk of the muscle, then we also talk of the bone, and we also talk of the joint together. This is knee arthritis. The odds ratio is 3.5. So people with sarcopenic obesity have a 3.5 higher chance of developing knee osteoarthritis. And when talking about osteoporosis, again, it's not only osteoporosis, but even vertebral fractures, which are more commonly associated with sarcopenic obesity. Talking about metabolic syndrome, you talk about diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, and you look at the odds, which are as high as eight times a patient with sarcopenic obesity would have eight times higher risk of developing metabolic syndrome as against only two times for people who just have sarcopenia. Not only affecting all these uh, metabolic parameters, but also affecting the psyche. And sarcopenic obesity has also been associated with depression. So cutting a long story short, what I'm talking today about is sarcopenic obesity and how this can influence all these different organ systems and most importantly increase mortality and this is why we as clinicians need to be aware of this entity so well we've so far talked about our increasing aging population we've talked about the different definitions of sarcopenic obesity and how our south asian ethnicity tends to be more prone to develop this particular phenotype we talked about its different uh, pathogenic factors and how this is a vicious cycle, but more importantly, also, we've looked at hardcore evidence with respect to the multitude effects that it can cause. Most important of it is the highest risk provided for mortality. And now the last bit of my talk where we talk about how do we manage it? And there are three broad pillars of management of sarcopenic obesity. It is the exercise, it is the diet, and it is the medications predominantly exercise and diet. Let's start with the exercise. And there are several studies that talk about how different types of exercise can increase the muscle strength, which is no big news. We all know that both resistance and aerobic training can definitely improve not only the muscle mass, but also muscle strength. Very simple exercises, given that we're talking of a disease that is more common in the elderly. So very simple exercises like chair exercises, using a band exercise, simple aerobic training is very helpful and it's not only just the exercise which is done as a short-term uh, plan but a long-term plan is something that goes in a long way but having known that we always remember that when we advise exercise to any person and specifically more in elderly we go in a very graded fashion we don't talk about resistance exercises on day one we first talk about flexibility enhancement, then teach them balance. We really don't want to have a fall and a fracture in somebody who's more prone to develop a fracture. Then we talk of aerobic exercises. And lastly, we talk of resistance exercises. And this is a graded prescription that we want to provide. Talking about diet, and uh, though there is a kind of a paradox where we're talking of low calorie diet, and that is to address the obesity part. But the important point is that we need to make up for the protein as well. So there is calorie restriction without restriction of protein. So even in clinical practice, when we talk of elderly people and we are trying to get their weight loss, it is very, very important to also talk about good protein intake for them because otherwise they would develop sarcopenia. Obviously good to also uh, ensure good calcium and vitamin D supplementation. But still, the most important aspect, especially again in the South Asian region, is talking about good, adequate protein intake, 1 to 1.2 grams per kg body weight. We're not talking of high protein diets. We're just recommending to take an amount of protein that should be taken by a normal, healthy individual. Very surprisingly, recently, when we looked at our own data, and this is data from a bariatric clinic, where most of our people are having morbid obesity, we see that despite consuming much more calories that one patient should 
for their given weight, they still don't meet up, meet up the amount of protein that they should be consuming. So definitely increase protein intake with calorie restriction is the mantra for managing sarcopenic obesity. Moving on to the last bit, which is talking about medications. And at this point, we talk of calcium and vitamin D, but there are no specific approved medications for sarcopenic obesity, but a lot in the pipeline that we need to be on the lookout for. The drugs which are being developed as myostatin inhibitors, the drugs like oral ghrelin analogs and several anti-obesity medications are being tested. Hormones do play a very important role, both a premature menopause needs to be addressed. And similarly, in men, late onset hypogonadism is indeed something that needs to be addressed to prevent sarcopenia. So with this, I think the treatment aspect of sarcopenic obesity in today's world is good exercise, resistance as well as aerobic, not starting with that, but gradually reaching to it. Good nutrition in terms of good protein intake, but a limited calorie intake. And that's how we address the problem of sarcopenic obesity. To conclude, I think we did speak of how and what is sarcopenic obesity. Just a confluence of high amount of fat with low protein or low muscle mass. We talked about simple methods of assessing sarcopenic obesity using simple questionnaires like the SARCF questionnaire. And also looking at the impact of sarcopenic obesity on different metabolic parameters, talking about mortality, talking about depression, as well as on the metabolic syndrome. And last, <coughs> we also talked about how we address this problem in terms of treatment. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions.